There are two huge questions at the heart of who we are as human beings. There are the things that we sometimes go to religion to uncover answers to. And those two questions are, why do terrible things happen in the world? And why do I do terrible things? And one of the stories that people have told throughout history is the idea uh, that there is some sort of cosmic evil that underlies in some way who we are, what we do. The story that we often tell ourselves that I wanted to write about in Entertaining Judgment has to do with Satan uh, or with other figures that are used in the same sort of way as devils who can be used to help explain why it is that bad things happen in the cosmos and why it is that we do things that we ought not to do. Now, Satan is a particularly interesting figure because he's another of these things that comes to us largely through our culture and literature and not so much through our faith traditions. In the Hebrew Testament, the Old Testament, the figure of Satan is actually an advocate, uh, a tool of God. And while some people point to the uh, serpent in the Garden of Eden as being Satan, the actual Hebrew for, uh, uh, that's used in that story is simply snake. Um, later writers and cultural commentators have decided that it was Satan who was the snake in the Garden of Eden. But that's not what the Bible tells us. When we get to the New Testament, we find Satan being used in a slightly different way. In the Gospels, people begin to think of their opponents as somehow diabolical, as standing in the way of God. And so we have Satan being used, especially in the Gospel of John, as this figure of cosmic evil who the enemies of the writers of the Gospels, um, the churches that have uh, grown up around those Gospel stories, some, somehow they must be affiliated with Satan to stand in God's way in this way. And so Satan becomes for us this figure who helps to explain why bad things happen. And in our literature and culture, Satan often becomes one of the powerful kinds of evil that must be overcome if good is to survive. There are, of course, lots of stories in our literature and culture about being tempted by Satan, that sort of Faustian bargain uh, that we find in the legend of Dr. Faustus that comes all the way up to the present. Um, in everything from uh, legends of blues musicians who were given their, uh, their blues prowess on uh, uh, midnight at a, a muddy crossroads in the deep south of America, uh, to the monkeys. Uh, one of the monkeys uh, tried to strike a Faustian bargain. Uh, and that, uh, well, nothing ever went well on the monkeys. When we look at more contemporary versions of Satan, say in the last couple of decades, we see two particular things happening. First, in some kinds of storytelling, Satan always is uh, a powerful evil that cannot be overcome. Uh, that's typically the case in horror stories. And so whatever the era, whatever else may be happening in the world at that time, if we're talking about Rosemary's Baby, if we're talking about the Omen stories, if we're talking about the Devil's Advocate, because the genre demands this powerful cosmic evil, if Satan appears in those movies, then what we find is that he is represented as a power that cannot be overcome. The other thing that's interesting, though, is that in other kinds of storytelling, Satan can go up and down in terms of how his prowess and his power is regarded. And that often has to do with how people in the culture are thinking about the state of the cosmos. And so it is that in times of great unrest, in uh, the late 1960s and early 70s, for example, you find satanic figures that are much more threatening, much more um, ominous. And then before and after, you find people like uh, Peter Cook's Satan in Bedazzled, who is more like a magician making bad things happen to little old ladies. In the uh, Clinton years in the United States, when uh, economic prosperity was rampant, the creators of South Park created a Satan who was mostly laughable, uh, who was unlucky at love, who pined to live up there, as the song that he sings in the South Park movie goes. And so there is this sense that in the larger culture, Satan rises and falls depending on how much evil we think the world contains at that given moment. But when things go bad again, post 9-11, uh, we find a whole lot of examples of Satan. Um, the Beast during the David Tennant run on Doctor Who. Um, the uh, Satan that's depicted in Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. Once again, we are back to this Satan who is in some sense responsible for all the terrible things that seem to be happening in the world around us. What interested me about writing about the Satan story was because 
it seems to be a story that many of us use to explain things, often without considering whether or not we actually believe in the story that we're thinking of. Most of us today don't believe in a Satan with horns and a pitchfork. But there is this very powerful sense, as with our desire to believe in angels, that we want to believe that there is something that underlies the chaos and the malice in the universe. We don't want to think that it's us. We'd like to blame it on somebody else. And that's why Satan is such a useful thing for artists, for writers, for storytellers.